Hi, this is John Sterling, and you're listening to the Bat Boys Corner Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number six of the Bat Boys Corner Podcast. I'm Billy Pinkney, coming at you from the Bat Boys Corner Studios in Little Falls, New Jersey. Today we're going to have another interesting episode as we will have pioneer in the sports collectibles and memorabilia industry, and that's Brandon Steiner. So we're going to take a quick break here in the Bat Boys Corner Podcast, and when we come back, we'll have Brandon Steiner on over the phone. Throughout my interviews over the years, I've always asked my interviewees what advice they would give to a younger player. I've decided to take those clips of motivational advice and turn them into Motivation Monday. Check BillyTheBatBoysCorner.com every Monday to receive brand new advice from professional athletes. We are back here on the Bat Boys Corner podcast with industry pioneer in the sports collectible and memorabilia industry, and that's Brandon Steiner. Mr. Steiner, thanks for coming on. Uh, Well, nice to be with you. And, you know, I can see I have a young, promising baseball enthusiast. I like the case behind you. I think that's one of my cases, actually. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, that's a... That's a whole story in itself, that case probably changed my life. And, you know, before we even get into the story, you know what the number one selling item, you know, when I was at Steiner, I'm not at Steiner anymore. I have my new platform, Collectible Exchange, right. which is more of an eBay and people can put their own stuff up. But 32 years, you know, built Steiner up and now moved to this new platform, which can be much more customer friendly. And the number one selling item was a case. <laughs> it's unbelievable crazy you and it was like a secondary third thought which we'll get into in a minute of how you come up with an idea like that because your first idea is never your best idea right and uh people need to really keep keep that in mind because as many good ideas you come up with the real good idea is the idea behind the good idea right now going way back uh you came from a modest background and pretty much created the sports memorabilia industry what gave you the idea to do this and, and how to all begin well, it's a good question. I mean, first of all, modest is probably uh, an overstatement. I mean, you know, I was poor. I mean, I was definitely the poorest kid in the neighborhood, and most of my friends, I was the poorest person they knew. Mm. I mean, uh, it was things were tough, and it's funny. A lot of people ask me because you know I started a very unusual business. Obviously, created a unique industry, or I had a I had a solid part of you know getting this industry to come together to be something that people can participate in, and it wasn't just a hobby which I don't recommend for all of these, those of you out there. But, you know, for me, it really started as a kid. I mean, I was a serial entrepreneur and I was always thinking about, um, I was just trying to think about how I could do something to be a little bit unique and a little different. And, and I really stumbled upon this business actually. And it wasn't even a business I wanted to get into. I was in a hotel restaurant business and I was kind of struggling to raise the money back in 1984. And I've been working since I'm 10 years old. So I just want you to know that making money wasn't a, a at some point as I started to uh, grow up was really a natural, easy thing for me. You know, finding the things you want to do and that may be a little harder. And I'd open up the first sports bar in Manhattan. And it may not sound, you know, somebody like yourself, this was before you were born, mm-hmm. but there was a time, and take that time in 1984, that you really had to go high and far to find a bar or a restaurant that had a TV in it, mm-hmm. let alone there was none that had a satellite. Right. So, you know, here I am, and I opened up many, many sports bars, LTs, the one Route 17, to uh, Mickey Mantle, sports on Broadway. But the first one I opened up was uh, the Sporting Club. And the Sporting Club was on 99 Hudson. It was the only satellite dish in all of Manhattan. And most, almost all restaurants didn't even have cable. There really wasn't a lot of cable even in Manhattan. So every athlete would come in and sports teams would come in because they want to watch these alternate games. It would take us forever. But anyway, before I started the sporting club, I left the place called the Hard Rock Cafe and it opened up in 1983. Now the Hard Rock was on 57th Street at the time. Now, if you know of it, the one in New York is the one on uh, 42nd. But the one on 57th was only the second Hard Rock ever. It was a huge, huge opening. It was a very, very, very big deal. I would say that, you know, my first year working there was this assistant general manager, just to give you an idea, there were 200 people online from three in the afternoon to two in the morning every day for the first year that I was there, wow. just to give you an idea of the depth. And the place sat 250 people and had two bars. Wow. And that was just to get into the place and it started at three. So my idea was as I'm working the Hard Rock meeting, Eddie Murphy, 
the Elton Johns, the Jackson Browns. I was a big sports nut, so it was cool mm. meeting the rock and roll stars too. But I was like, wow, this hard rock's cool, but it'd be cool to do it in sports. Right. So I hooked up with a guy from the New York Yankees who was a limited partner. His name is Billy Rose. Great guy. He's actually in the business. He's an agent now, but he had a Caesars Palace scoreboard, and we opened up the first dynamic sports bar that was kind of like a hard rock and decorated with memorabilia. Uh -huh. So when I couldn't, you know, when I couldn't get the place open that I wanted to open up my own, I opened up Steiner Sports, and uh, really came from the fact that I could not raise the money to open up my own sports bar, which would have been more of a ultimate sports bar, like an ESPN zone with the games. That's ultimately what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. The sporting club and the first five or six sports bars were much more conservative, a lot of TVs, some games. And then ultimately they started opening up these ultimate sports bars with all kinds of papa shots and pool tables and foosball. You know, I met a lot, a lot of people, you know, between the hard rock and, and, and the sporting club and those relationships ended up, you know, getting me interested in maybe what I was just thinking is I would just help some of the athletes out right. and I was opening up fan mail. When I first started Steiner, I was opening up fan mail, helping athletes with some charity events, booking a couple athletes here and there, and then doing some consulting on the sports bars. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying to stick around long enough to figure it out. Right. And not go out of business and uh i'd like to tell you i had this great strategic plan and vision but i didn't um <laughs> but i was a sports enthusiast and i didn't even realize the relationships that i was making back then how valuable they'd be uh because it wasn't that's not how things were back then you know there was no cell phones no computers no internet if you had an athlete's phone numbers that was gold you had his house you had his home number yeah. and that was the only phone he had so that was a big deal to get out these numbers and I started accumulating thousands and thousands of numbers and waiting outside locker rooms and waiting in the parking lot just to meet players so I have their numbers. And then I literally would go to as many companies as I could and say, look, I can help your business grow. I could get you this athlete. I know this athlete loves this particular product and he endorse it. We'll go on TV and talk about it or maybe we can do an event around it. And that's yeah. how I got Steiner going. Wow. As you just mentioned, you know, you started talking to athletes and then you added that to your product line by having meet and greets and stuff like that at Steiner. Yeah, um, $4,000, by the way. <laughs> I have 4000 in the bank. I bought a Mac Plus and a printer that was 3200 and I had 800 in my cash flow when I got rolling. Oh, wow. Yeah. Actually, I want to show you this. We got the picture. This is uh, both of us at the uh, Victor Cruz meet and greet years ago. And then we got a, wow. a ball. <laughs> it's not the it's not the game. Oh, you it's the game were a little plan. kid then. How yeah. nervous was Victor in that meeting greet though? Yeah. I mean, he was so nervous. Now he's like a natural. He's like a superstar. Right. So it's funny when you meet these guys when they're young and then they grow up. It's amazing. He's a tremendous story in his own right. How he's grown and and how well he's now done with the media and his sneakers and his fashion. I, I love seeing guys progress and grow and be just more than even athletes. Not everyone gets that opportunity, but. He figured it out. It was a nice, nice relationship I had with him. Right. Now, you've always been known to back your product. Do you think that's an important part of business? I think it's an important part of life. I mean, I think, you know, I always I always talk about, you know, you got to you gotta do what you say. Mm -hmm. You, know, you got to back it up. And, and you don't need a contract. You shouldn't need, you know, you should have a reputation that when you say something, you're going to do it. And uh, I think that's probably one of the most important principles in my game. Because, you know, you're dealing with a lot of really weird characters. These athletes are a little different. Some are really great. Some are not so great. Mm -hmm. And most of them are pretty good. But, you know, you, you know, different things happen in your word and making sure things happen that you say are going to happen are critical. And having a reputation that you will at all costs make it happen if you said it's going to happen is very important. And it's, believe me, it wasn't that easy to develop this reputation. Right. I've lost a few friends and athletes that I've had to kind of put my... Uh, finger on it you know they're like well i can't make it i'm like oh no you're making it yeah and uh, i've got into some pretty good fights it's not something i uh well it's something i regret actually because i hate you know you have an argument with an athlete there is no other athlete like that athlete they're all very unique and special and you don't want to have an argument with a player but you you have to understand the importance of keeping your word right and sometimes you, you have to blow up an athlete to make sure that your operation and my employees know that when we say we're doing something, we're going to do it. And I would go to whatever length to make it happen. And there are a couple of players that I definitely went a little too far on to mm -hmm. make sure that they showed up. And, you know, it's tough. Now, when I look back on that, I wish I hadn't had gone to that level. But, you know, that's that's the reputation you want to have, that you're going to make things happen and you're going to make sure that they do. Right. 
Um, how did the authentication, Yankees- authentication and memorabilia is everything. I mean, people need to know that when it, you're selling something that you know they don't want to have any doubt. It's, I always tell people the difference between ninety nine percent and one hundred percent is one hundred percent of doubt. So there is no, it's 99% good. You know, no, no, our stuff is 100% good. Yeah. Any differential is 100% no good. <laughs> there is no gap. There's no like kind of happy median, you know, that kind of thing. Right. I just want to talk about how, you know, that deal uh, with the Yankees played out um, when they were knocking the stadium down. How did that all come about? Did they come to you or did you go to them? Well, I had cut a deal with the Yankees to form a relationship called Yankee Steiner uh, several years before. And I'm very grateful. I mean, there's not, nothing like the Yankee organization, obviously. What's crazy is that took two years to put that deal together. And, you know, the Yankees, as big a company as they are, they're, they are, you know, I always say the devil's in the detail and, and they are a detailed company. As much as big as they are, they don't just throw things against the wall. They are, they do what they say and they live by what they say. And, you know, fans first, quality of product first, everything else is a distant second. So when we put that deal together, I mean, it was a lot of detail. And what I love about the Yankees, they got into that detail. It wasn't just the money grab. It was a protection of their fans. It was a respect for the operation and the brand and, and making sure we uphold that. So everything was in order and we were starting to roll. And then, you know, we got the contract done. In the last minute, I remember going, and I don't know if this deal ever would have happened without a Randy Levine and certainly a lot of Tros and the Steinbrenners. So, you know, Randy and I, we spent hours, and this is as much – his credit really as anyone. So anyway, like the last minute I got into those guys, I said, you know, if you ever knock down the stadium, like I've definitely got to sell it. I mean, I don't know if you guys are ever going to do that. And you know, it's funny as they said to me, Brandon, we're definitely not changing the deal, but you have our word. We'll work with you if we can. And you know, the city really owns the stadium, but you know, we'll try to work you in. And what I love about the Yankees is five years later, they call me say, Brandon, we made that promise to you. You know, let's sit down and talk about what's involved here. And, what I love about it is I've, done, I've taken out a lot of stadiums, by the way, hmm. uh, Texas, the Garden. Um, I've, I've done a bunch. And what I love about it is a lot of the teams, when you get take the, like the Meadowlands I took down, but then when it gets down to it, most of the teams are focused on the new stadium. They don't want to spend a lot of time in the old stadium. Hmm. I told the Yankees that this is the most important building on the planet as far as a sports building. And it needs to go down with respect and dignity. And, and the fans need a little bit of a mourning period. And they also need to get a piece. So I don't only really want to sell it. I want to sell it in hundreds of thousands of pieces. And most of the teams, when I tell them that about their building, they laugh at me. But the Yankees, what I love about them is that they supported that. They And, and, and it's not just a yes, okay, that you could do that. There's a lot of support that I needed with the physicality of getting this stuff, the marketing of it, the patience of us getting our money back. They walk the walk and talk the talk with me because, you know, I'm a little bit of a quirky marketer and they had the faith in me to, to really break this thing down in an unusual, respectful way. And I think the fans really appreciated it because we did break it down into hundreds of thousands of pieces. Right. And it did cost about 18 million. You can read about this in my You Gotta Have Balls book. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're a little down yeah. right now, if you go to my collect, if you go to my site, you can get that book for free and just pay for the shipping. Oh, wow. If you just go to Collectible Exchange, or cxstuff.com, you get that book for free, just pay for the shipping. It's really a good read, and it really explains about not only the Yankee Stadium, but it just explains how the whole company comes about and a lot of detailed stories. So that's how it went down, and, and, and you know, it took about four years to really take the whole stadium project through from beginning mm-hmm. to beginning, where most teams wouldn't have the patience for me to do that, but I really wanted it to be a three or four year project, and it really did take that long. And you know, I don't regret it. It wasn't a great money maker. We made a little bit of money here or there, but there's a lot of stories to it. But it was just a it was a labor of love. And I'm a big Yankee fan. I know how Yankee fans feel about that stadium. And I'm glad that I was able to get the seats and the seat backs and all the little things around the stadium to that. Yeah. It's cool. We got a, another thing here. We got a seat yeah. back. <laughs> oh, boy. You're a, you're a diehard. Oh, man. we got a lot here. <laughs> <laughs> got a base down for, there. I'm looking forward to selling that stuff on my new website, which you know you can just go on and put anything you want on there, almost like an eBay version. So that's cool. Right. So how does that work with you know your old you know you you know you divested from Steiner and then you now have the Steiner Agency and Collectible Exchange. Yeah. Talk about the old business model and how it compares to the new one. I mean, it's just different. What I'm really trying to do is I'm ultimately going to have the fans be able to buy from the athletes directly. So when you go on Collectible Exchange, you'll see a bunch of player websites. You'll be able to buy from the players directly, which is cool. And then the players are going to dictate a lot more of the pricing. 
But what's cool about collectibles change is that you can go on the site and put stuff up. And then if somebody who's buying something on the site wants to get clarification or authentication, we help with that process uh. to make sure you know what you're getting is real. Because not to knock eBay, but I will. You know, you don't really don't know what you're getting. Is I mean, there is some good stuff on eBay, but there's also a lot of bad stuff. And there's nobody navigating. And I feel you need a highway like eBay, but that has more navigation and more eyeballs on it to make sure that the customer and the consumer, the fan is protected. Because there's some really cool stuff out there, especially from some of the baby boomers are getting older now that are selling their stuff that are now looking to turn it over. I think this is going to be a great avenue for them to sell it. Right. And that's my goal is to help them do that and make sure the changeover and the transformation of this stuff can be done smoothly and then put the fans closer to the game I mean, what's better than going to a mariano rivera or to a peyton manning or to an aaron Rodgers directly and be able to get an autograph from them and an email from aaron Rodgers or something like that that would be pretty cool right so we're working on it's a work in progress i'm a startup <laughs> two sticks together man yeah and, you know back to me and like my 21 year old again so it's exciting yeah. Now, with the international footprint of baseball expanding in places like Japan, South Korea, and even Australia and the UK, I think your new company will capture a larger market share than the old one. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on around the world, but there's also a lot of education. People forget the amount of education. If you Google me, I mean, I've done hundreds and hundreds of interviews to explain how collecting works mm. and how the process works. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't think there's a lot of countries out there, as much as they're fanatical about their sports, they're not educated about collecting and that there's value in autographs, there's value in game use. And I'm not sure I'm the one who's going to go to London and, and explain to a bunch of Brits about how uh, this kid from Brooklyn is going to explain how collecting should get done. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm definitely going to form a bunch of partnerships and there's, there's you know, there's a process here, you know, you know, to everybody wants to open up a market but the true entrepreneurs know you got to develop a market and you got to work into a market to build the kind of credibility and then the goal is to activate the market but a lot of people kind of skip those first two steps and that's a big mistake um, i feel like i've activated this market in a, in, a, in, a, in a very patient manner respectful manner and it does take time and you need some of the partnerships to do it you know like a jeter and and uh some of the different athletes that have been mainstays or mark messier you know, there's been a bunch of athletes that have been my partners that really work with me to help cultivate and develop this market that's now out there. Right. What are some of your goals as you move forward with the new company? Well, uh, you know, again, I mean, I love to see a lot more trading and having a lot more, you know, you buy something doesn't mean you have to be stuck with it for life. Mm. I mean, sometimes you love this and now you want to maybe move that and trade it. And it would be nice to have a, a trading platform where people can move stuff around. I think there's some amazing collectors. I mean, I've been in a, I've been a crazy collector, but as I've been in this business for 32 years, it's crazy collectors out there. Yeah. They've got some really cool creative stuff and I'd love that for them to be able to showcase their stuff, tell their stories about their stuff, uh, sell, buy, you know, have a, a more open highway as opposed to kind of the way Steiner was necessarily my old company where, you know, you were kind of forced to have to buy this or that the way you wanted it. Now I'm going to give fans and, and now that they're more educated, the ability to kind of customize their collections a lot more and showcase them. That's where I see it. The Steiner agency is my bread and butter and my love because I always love marketing players and helping companies grow, using players to market it. You know, I wake up in the morning and I always got an idea of, of, a, of a product and then a player that I want to help uh, maybe use to market it. And I, I walk around supermarkets for three hours just looking at products and see how I connect them to players because I've spent so much time which is crazy with so many of these players and getting to know them and their personalities. So I feel like I'm able to make those matches so that they're authentic and that they make sense to the consumer of why a player particularly is matched up with a particular product. And that's, that's where you hit the home run. Right. Now I want to touch on this case right here, the story behind the case. I watched a video where you were talking about it. It's a pretty interesting story how it all started. I mean, the case thing is interesting because, um, I remember my guy walking in my office, I think it was my warehouse guy, and he's like, Grant, we got a problem. I said, What's the problem? We're overstocked on balls, and uh, we got way too much inventory. And he says to me, uh, we got to do something. I said, wow, we got balls. And it was just as clear as day. And then I, I put out a billboard, I did a couple ads with, you know, we got balls and a picture of a bunch of balls. So he comes back to me about three weeks later. He goes, you know, I think that program, those emails and the billboards work. And he goes, but you know, we got basketballs, footballs. I go, we got big balls. So I, I put another billboard up like a, a mile down the highway, did another ad. So we back to back said, we got balls, we got big balls. 
And I always say your first idea is not your best idea. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to rack my brain. Like, what am I missing here? And I was thinking about, you know something? Everybody's got balls, but not everybody's got a place to put your balls. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, people, people, you know, people take seriously where you put your balls, right? Especially if you've got balls that really matter. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm kidding around, I'm joking, but yeah. you know, if you have a Mickey Mantle ball, Babe Ruth ball, at the time we were just working with a cube. Right. And, uh, you, know, like, you know, like this, we were just working with a cube and this was like a, a 40, 50 cent product that'd sell for $5. It's crazy, you know? And I was like, you know, that ball, the balls deserve better respect. So I came up with that glass case that's behind you, which was a 1999 proposition that cost me about four dollars and fifty cents to make or something like that right and then so i was doing pretty well i was happy but again your first idea is not your best idea and what i did is i realized like now what's in that case by the way what's this is uh, the grass from the old stadium oh yeah yeah of course it's grass and we'll get into that in a second <laughs> but anyway um well, a big problem with balls is you can't always read the, the signature on the ball mm -hmm. and i was thinking that like you know well one problem for people is they didn't have a really cool place to put their balls but the other problem people had is they, you know, had a hard time sometimes reading the signature. So I was a big photo guy, as you know, and I've always had a great eye for photos. So I, I created a photo case and then I took right. some of this game used dirt that I'm known for. I think we sold over $50 million of dirt and I put that on the bottom of the case and I created a photo dirt case. I moved from 19.99 to 39.99, but I only added a dollar cost to the product. And customers are calling me going crazy you know, saying yeah. that, thank you so much. And I think that when you actually listen to your customers and think about not selling, but solving a problem, you know, I think you gotta be a solution-based entrepreneur and not a money-making entrepreneur initially. You know, you wanna not sell, you wanna solve. Mm -hmm. When you focus on solving a problem, it leads to selling and everybody wins. And I think, you know, thinking about people had such a problem reading what the signature was on the balls or putting your balls in a really protective case and not just putting in a little cute, that kind of thing. Now your creativity goes a little crazy. Like I've sold more grass than any of you and anybody on this platform legally. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Scott Krug at the Yankees uh, and I came up with this idea. We were going to lift the grass up from the last game ever at Yankee stadium. And then we brought it to this forest that we were working with that would freeze dry it. And that's what you have here. Right. Uh, 11 years later, right? And was, <laughs> you probably bought that for about $129 or $99. Yeah. And there's great margins on grass, by the way. And I, I know a lot of you know that. I mean, you know, if you can grow your own grass and sell it, there's nothing better. <laughs> but what's crazy about that is we went to Notre Dame, Red Sox, Wrigley. And we started pulling up the grass on all those fields. And so we made some really good money, made some customers happy because people want to remember there is something special about the dirt and the grass of some of those special fields like Fenway. Notre Dame and Yankee Stadium. So we thought it was worth saving. And that was kind of a phase I went through. Um, yeah. I really started actually through an overstocked uh, ball problem. Yeah. And there's a dirt thing too with the little capsules of dirt with the uh, different stadiums and stuff like that. With the, you know. So I've sold more dirt. You know, I always tell people like some of the best things you create start sometimes with a problem or something bad. So if something bad, you know, like right now we're going through something bad, but a lot of times, it'll lead you to something great. You know, many times some of the worst things that happen to you, if you think about some of your breakups with your boyfriends or girlfriends or a job you got fired, sometimes will lead you to some of the best opportunities. I'm hoping this virus uh, holds true with what I just said. Although this has been, a, you know, been really a rough time and, and it's always sad to lose a bunch of people as we have in the tri-state area. But mm -hmm. um, on the lesson learned on this business principle, which is your first idea is never your best idea. You got to keep digging. Don't start moving on to other ideas just because you had one good one. Keep digging on the good one. And most importantly, if you're going through something bad, it usually means it's taking you through ultimately to something good. So figure out what you can learn from what just happened, whether it be good or bad. It sometimes will take you to something even better. Right. Now, before I let you go, we know what your best piece of advice is, the title of your book, but what other piece of advice you know you just kind of touched on it but you know what would you say to a, someone who's trying to get started in business well you know it's it, it's it's nice to be important it's more important to be nice and i think that you have to listen i think it's important to dream big and i think it's really important to not i think the best advice i could give you is it's really not really about where you are it's about what you're willing to accept 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're the bat boy right now and you want to be the general manager one day, that's okay. You just can't accept that you're just going to stay the bat boy. Once you get into a non-committal state, then you can then get into a non-acceptance. You can get into now what it's going to take. Only until you're not willing to accept it where you are, only until you get completely committed and convicted about not accepting where you're at, whether it be a position you have, the grade you have in school, um, the amount of money you're making, you have to get completely committed that you're not willing to accept it anymore. And then you start digging in to figure out what it's going to take to get to the next level to keep moving forward. What's important is you have this non-committal state on an everyday basis. One of the biggest complaints that most of my employees had is that, Brady, you're never happy. I said, no, I'm happy. I'm never satisfied. No matter how good a day we had today, it doesn't carry over to tomorrow. I always want to have a better day today than yesterday, and I'm always consistent in doing that. And it reminds me of a quick story I'll tell you just to drive home that point, Mm -hmm. because I think uh, consistency over time equals credibility, and nothing else, nothing else matters. But I was sitting in uh, Tampa Stadium watching a spring training game. I was waiting for Mariano. I was going to meet him after the game. And about the fifth inning, all of a sudden, Mariano pops up and sits down next to me. Now, I'm not going to lie. Like, that was a wow moment because I've met him a bunch of times. I've been with him a gazillion. It wasn't that, but I'm like, I'm watching a Yankee game in the stadium with Mariano. It was cool. Right. Especially just like his prime. It was like the middle of his prime of his career. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You were just pitching 10 minutes ago. He goes, I just pitched one inning in spring training. So I turn to him. I go, ah, no big deal. Just an inning spring training. He goes, no. I pitch in spring training the same way I pitch game seven in the World Series. The same way I pitch on the bottom of the ninth with the game on the line. I never deviate once I go on that mound in how I pitch in my mindset. I look at every opportunity when I go on the mound, like everything is on the line. So when I get into the World Series, I get in the bottom of the ninth. I don't have to start getting myself hyped up that this is a big game. I don't have to get myself into a mindset that's anything different than what I'm normally used to. Right. I thought it was one of the most riveting points that he brought up to me, which is, you know, again, consistency over time equals credibility. When you start sizing things up, I've got a big meeting. I've got a big test. Is it really a big test if you've been studying every day? Not really. Mm. Is it really a big date if you've been? Is it real? No. And, and it's disrespectful to all the other meetings you have. you got this big meeting. What are you saying about all the other meetings? So I think that was a really profound way of looking at it. And I think you've got every day has got to be game seven. And I think that's how I am in business. That's the people that know me for business. I treated you if you were buying a $20 gift to a million dollar deal, I treated everybody with the highest level of intensity because you never know that $20 gift today, that little picture with you as a little boy, Mm -hmm. you may grow up and very good chance you'll be a CEO of a big company and you may end up being one of my biggest customers. So I always take every customer, every project with the same level of intensity that Mariana taught me that day. And then the last lesson I want to share with you, which is you must, and is critical, implement and and focus on the common good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just all about you, what you can do, what you can make. I think the money grab is important. I think, you know, following your dreams, if it's a big house or a lot of cars, whatever it is, but the common good is also very important. And what you can do for your community, for your neighborhood, for your team, for your company, whether you get credit or dollars back or there has to be a portion of what you do that doesn't matter because what matters is you're putting your heart and soul into the common good. And I think we're seeing that as we go through this virus that a lot of people that spend a lot of their livelihoods and, and a lot of their life for the common good and that we probably have taken for granted. And I think it doesn't have to just be nurses and first responders and doctors. I think it should be everyone have that responsibility to focus on the common good. And mainly because it's everything. I mean, that's the stuff you're going to feel best about. I mean, tell me you haven't woken up the last few weeks feeling like, wow, I wish I was a nurse. I wish I was a doctor that could put myself on the line to help here. But the reality is you can. Everybody has their moments to, to do the common good. You know, the most important things don't wait for it. And, and, you know, you find your passion. You find the things that you want to do. And some of them are just money grabs. So you can live a great life. But the common good is really important, too. Consistency over time equals credibility. Critical. Yeah. Every day is game seven, my man. And don't forget it. <laughs> Great stuff. Great stuff. Before I let you go, how can people find out about what you do and what you offer? I mean, a lot of this stuff is if you go to brandonsteiner.com, you know, you just register to the blog or I'm a big LinkedIn guy. You got to follow me on LinkedIn or just like me on Facebook. 
Um, but the best thing is, you, know, you get my blog, you get a lot of this information. And there's also right now a free 22 laws of negotiation on my on brandonsigner.com, which has like a $49 value. You get it for free. If you go to cxstuff.com, if you want to get one of my books, actually, we're giving it away free through Sunday oh, wow. uh, for the next week. So you can pick up the book for free, just pay for shipping. I answer every message myself personally. So I love to hear from people, love to hear what you liked about the conversation. If you got a question, you want to know what something's worth, love hearing from you. I still love the business and love interacting with people and fans and uh, collectors. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on and uh, you know, stay safe. And we're going to take a quick break here on the Bat Boys Corner Podcast. Anchor Down Sports Performance and Billy the Bat Boys Corner have partnered up to bring to you Tip Tuesday. Tips from professional baseball player Conrad Greger. These tips are designed for young players who are learning the game of baseball and look to improve their skills. You can find these videos for free on BillyTheBatBoysCorner.com or on the YouTube channel Billy the Bat Boys Corner. We are back here on the Bat Boys Corner podcast. We just had Brandon Steiner on over the phone, and he talked about his business and how he operates. And if you want to learn more about what he's doing, go check out BrandonSteiner.com. He has a lot of great content and stuff up there as well. And with that, we're going to wrap it up here on the Bat Boys Corner podcast. We'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. And stay connected with us by following us on Instagram at Billy underscore the underscore Bat Boys underscore Corner. On Twitter at Billy the Bat Boy, on Facebook as Billy the Bat Boy's Corner, and on TikTok as Billy the Bat Boy. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe and turn on post notifications so you can be notified every time we post a new episode. Episode number seven will be out soon, so stay tuned. That'll do it for now, and we'll see you next time here on the Bat Boy's Corner Podcast. Hi, this is John Sterling, and you're listening to the Bat Boy's Corner Podcast.